Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Wreck and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'm going to do a video on The Decapitated Chicken by Horacio Quiroga, who is an Uruguayan short story writer, and it's a horror story. It was published in 1909, so the early 20th century, and uh, Quiroga was an avowed modernist. So we have a horror story written by a modernist, a juxtaposition that we, we don't find very often. Um, and I first read this story in June as I've been uh, reading through the different stories in this volume, which is excellent. And I reread it this week because I wanted to have the distance, the perspective, to be able to say very sincerely that The Decapitated Chicken is quite possibly the single most horrifying story I've ever read. Um, I don't know if it's the scariest, but, but the specificity of the horror at the climax is, is visceral, it is absolutely brutal. And so because of that, I'm going to do something I rarely, if ever, do in a video. In the description box, um, below the recommended if you like section where I'm going to list everything I'll talk about at the end of the video. I am going to put in a, a couple of quick trigger warnings because both the, the horror at the climax and the secondary horror that overlays the entire story, um, I think could have a very, very intense impact on, on readers. Um, I, I really believe that. So I'm, I'm going to put it in for this video. Uh, but let's jump in and talk about this story. So as I mentioned, it's published in 1909. And we're told right away uh, in the very first sentence that there's a family that has four sons who are developmentally disabled. And in the, that page, it gets down to they're between the ages of eight and 12. And they just sit there all day. We get a description of what their day is like. They just sit out there. There's no sense of contact with any other people. And they just kind of stare and watch the sun. Um, and there's a, a mention that uh, uh, they, uh, they stare at the sun with bestial joy as if it were something to eat. Other times lined up on the bench, they hummed for hours on end, imitating the sound of the trolley. Loud noises, too, shook them from their inertia. Um, and so we have that. And, and then we're told, after this quick you know, drop in on, on these sons, we're told about their parents, that they, had, they, they were married, and then um, shortly after being married, they just realized, like, hey, we want to have kids. So they have a son who's healthy, and he, uh, he at 20 months, um, has meningitis, and so in the convulsions, uh, it leads to him being disabled. And the language that is used there is really quite horrifying itself. Um, it says, uh, the child's paralyzed limbs recovered their movement, but the soul, the intelligence, even instinct were gone forever. And that's going to be critical. Um, the, the way that uh, Kiroga uses language to have the parents describe their own children is is one of the things I'm, it's going to be in the description box there, but it's, it's very dehumanizing the way the parents start to view their children. They initially say, okay, we, we wanted this to be this golden heir that we were going to have. So let's try again and have another child and, and just have one that's, that's normal. That child also um, uh, contracts meningitis and, it, you know, is, is affected in the same way. They have a pair of twins um, who's, who are affected in the same way. So now they have these four sons and they seem to, to want to try and find a way to, to show love for them. And we're told that the mother specifically spends time taking care of them. Um, beyond the immense bitterness, Mazzini and Berta maintained great compassion for their four sons. Uh, and so they, 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 they try to spend time with them. Um, but uh, the parents start to have some conflicts with each other. And rather than viewing the children as their own and, and loving them, they start to uh, impute them as some, you know, progeny of, of solely the other. And so Kiroga actually states, um, it began with the change of pronouns, your sons. And since they intended to trap as well as insult each other, the atmosphere became charged. It seems to me Manzini, who had just come in and was washing his hands, said to Berta that you could keep the boys cleaner. As if she hadn't heard him, Berta continued reading. It's the first time, she replied after a pause, I've seen you concerned about the condition of your sons. Mazzini turned his head toward her with a forced smile. Our sons, I think. All right, our sons. Is that the way you like it? Um, and so we see this plants the seeds of a conflict that they now, rather than viewing the children as their own and, and you know, humans who deserve love, they are, are casting the children out as, as these are yours. This is, and, and, and in the sense that they're saying, this is your problem, this is your fault, as if these children who've done nothing wrong um, are, are, uh, are, are, a, are a problem. And so it goes on uh, that, you know, they, they have this fight and other fights occur, but then they have a daughter. And so they have this daughter who does not uh, contract meningitis. And so she 
is developing, she has, you know, a couple of birthdays, but there's, they always spoil her. And it's important to note that the parents basically stop uh, taking care of um, the two sons. Um, although even in the later years, Berta had continued to care for the four boys. After Bertita's Beth birth, she virtually ignored the other children. The very thought of them horrified her, like the memory of something atrocious she had been forced to perform. The same thing happened to Mazzini, though to a lesser degree. And so it goes on until they start, the parents can, you know, start having more vituperative fights. Uh, in one, um, the husband accuses the wife of being a consumptive viper, and she brings up the fact that uh, his grandfather um, uh, became mentally ill when he was older. And so they're, they're continuing this fight. And so on a, in the climax, and please, <laughs> this is, this is going to be pretty, pretty intense. Um, the, the sons witness, uh, a chicken, um, you know, being, having its neck wrung and then being plucked and bled out, uh, to make for, uh, for their lunch. And then the parents leave and spend a whole day. I believe in Buenos Aires, and when they return, the uh, daughter runs in, and they, they kind of aren't paying attention to her, and so the sons see her, and having um, seen what was done to the chicken, they proceed to do that to their uh, little sister, um, and the parents discover it at the end. It is, as I said, it is truly horrifying. Um, as a parent, as an, a teacher, as someone who spends time around kids, it's an absolutely brutal story. And we're, as readers, we're, we're meant to think that the, the horror is what happens to the sister at the end. But as I met, and, and that, is, that is the part, like when I first read it, I was just, I, I was uncomfortable throughout the story. And then I hit that moment and it was, it broke me. But the secondary horror across the entire story is the way the parents have treated the four sons. The way that they have viewed them as, without a soul, um, as beasts, as animals, and the language they use, um, the way they view them as your problem in, in the worst way possible, that there is also this horror of what has happened to these, these four boys throughout their lives, throughout the past, you know, several years of their lives, and the way they've been treated and the way they've been viewed. Um, and so th those are sort of these two strands of horror that run across the, the story and, and really have made it for me just one that I, I can't get out of my mind. Um, and, and that it makes me reflect on, on you know, how do, how do we treat everyone? Um, not just the, the violence that is that is done to the daughter at the end, but also um, the dehumanizing ways that, that people interact with, with each other. And sadly, that parents sometimes will even um, uh, interact with their children with. Um, and so, so it's really brutal. Now, in terms of a, a, a theme or message across it, I think this story ends up in that um, be careful what you wish for uh, vein of stories, similar to, of course, The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs is a great one of that. Um, but the, the parents, uh, there's this be careful what you wish for. So they had wished initially, uh, what greater happiness for two people in love than that blessed consecration of an affection liberated from the vile egotism of purposeless love and what is worse for love itself, love without any possible hope of renewal. Um, and so they, they wanted to have these children and to truly have like compassionate love that can't be, re you know, returned. Um, and that is what they get in their sons and then they despise them. Uh, they uh, wish at, at one point, as they see the, the four sons, um, they must rest from the limbo of deepest animality, not, again, the language, not their souls, lost now, but instinct itself. So they want the, the sons to recover this sense of instinct. That's, that becomes their new great wish. That's exactly what the sons recover. Having watched, you know, the, the, the um, chicken be strangled in blood, that that is then the behavior in order to obtain food that they imitate at the end of the story. And so the parents achieve that, be careful what you wish for, across it. And it's in part because of the ways in which they, they receive what they want. And in their own, like, evil, you know, selfish desires, their refusal to, to see, you know, the beauty and the humanity in front of them, 
they create uh, th this environment. Um, and so it is absolutely horrifying. Uh, the translation by Margaret Sayers Payton was excellent, as it has been in all of these stories. Um, but this story is one I really can't get out of my mind. Um, in terms of other works, I kept thinking of uh, The Wild Duck by Henrik Ibsen, uh, which has a similar, um, you know, uh, violence involving children within it. And even to a certain extent, his play Ghosts, uh, where the, the children suffer for this, you know, uh, the choices of the parents. Um, but, but Wild Duck was one that I, I kept thinking about, and then that sent me off on a rabbit trail where I read the ninth story from Day 5 in Boccaccio's Decameron, which is believed to have been a, a root story for the Wild Duck, uh, and that as well involves you know, the death of a child um, and a, a bird being served as a meal. And so I don't know that Quiroga had, had read Ibsen. I, doubt, I somehow doubt that. I think he read Ibsen later in life. Um, but I wonder if he had read that story in the Decameron and if it was part of the seed. Um, his own uh, marriage did involve quite a bit of, of fighting um, and ultimately uh, like mental health issues. And um, I don't know if there was violence, but what's curious is that uh, he wrote this story before he and his wife, I believe, married and certainly before they had children. Um, which, which was kind of interesting. I was reminded as well of the um, sort of the Iphigenia myth um, involving Agamemnon. But a huge influence, an, an avowed influence on um, Quiroga was the Nicaraguan poet uh, Ruben Dario, who sort of kicked off modernism in uh, Central and South America. And so his poem Nocturne feels analogous. You who listen to the heart of night, you who in persistent insomnia have heard the closing of a door, the rumble of a faraway carriage, a vague echo, a slight noise. At the moments of mysterious silence, when the forgotten rise from their bonds, at the hour of the dead, at the hour of rest, you will know how to read these verses, impregnated with bitterness. I pour into them as into a cup my griefs for faraway memories and sinister disasters, and the sad yearnings of my soul, drunk with flowers and the sorrow of my heart, tired of merrymaking and repentance for not being what I might have been, the loss of the kingdom which was meant for me, and the thought that at one moment I might have avoided being born, and the dream that my life has been ever since I was born. All this comes in the midst of the deep silence in which the night wraps the illusion of earth, and I seem to hear an echo from the world's heart that pierces and moves my own. Um, which is a, a beautiful poem, a haunting poem. Dario was uh, deeply influenced by French poetry, uh, specifically French poets like Decadence and Symbolists who were influenced by Edgar Allan Poe, who also influenced Quiroga. So I, 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 as I was reading this, I was kind of thinking around stories like The Black Cat and The Telltale Heart, where there, there's um, a level of violence, um, and it's specific violence, uh, and yet Quiroga takes that and, and transmutes it into something that feels much more horrifying than uh, anything Poe ever quite accomplished. Um, another writer, uh, somewhat contemporary, I think he was a bit about t writing about 10 years later than Quiroga would be Idogo Arampo, uh, who also was a horror writer. Um, then I was thinking around stories by Richard Matheson, who I think captures an element of the horror that uh, Quiroga was conjuring. Of course, Clive Barker's Books of Blood, Stephen King's short stories. Uh, I feel more and more that Quiroga is, a, is an influence, unconscious or conscious, on Stephen King. Um, I had mentioned The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs, but the way in which Quiroga shows characters who, who are so willing to dehumanize through their behavior and through their language uh, reminded me of what's going on in um, 2666 by Roberto Bolaño. And seeing how parents deal with, uh, and I shouldn't say deal with, how parents choose to love or, or choose to not love a child who's developmentally disabled reminded me, of course, of um, Benji Compson in The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. So this was The Decapitated Chicken. Um, I hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm going to go hug my kids. Um, but uh, Quiroga, I think, is a masterful uh writer and he conjures horrors that we, we very few other writers uh, reach. So if, if that's something you're interested in, I highly recommend checking them out and I uh, hope everybody's doing well.